Now the next speaker is Nico. Uh, Nicola Vitello, who is also a professor here in the Biorobotics Institute uh, in Pisa, and uh, but is, uh, he has a, also an uh, almost as cool or more cool activity as an interpreter, and uh, is the chairman of UVO SRL, uh, UVO, which is a company which is uh, developing and selling exoskeleton for assistive and other purposes, but he knows more about that. So let's listen to, to Nicola. So Nicola. Good morning to everybody. Uh, yeah, thanks Fabio for, for inviting me here. I mean, I'm very happy. Uh, yeah, as, as Fabio said, I'm, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm a researcher and I'm trying to be an entrepreneur. So I will talk more about my research activities and then in the very end I will tell you what, what's it going, what is going on with my startup company. And as you will see from the title of the presentation, I, I'm, I mean, I work in the field of wearable robotics, so exoskeletons. Today are very, very cool. Uh, I mean, it's a cool research trend. I'm trying to give my contribution to, to it. And yeah, that's the content of the presentation. And, um, and huh? ah, I should also look in the camera. Yeah, I mean, family, yeah, okay. I'm not as expert as you, you know. Um, you, know, you can also zoom. I mean, this is incredible. Yeah, yeah I'm not like Richard Gere. Or, <laughs> sorry for that. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the, 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 the contents um, of the presentation. I will go uh, quite uh, quickly through um, some of the devices that we recently developed, uh, starting from what is our dream, and our dream is the, this idea of human-robot symbiosis. I mean, the driver of, of my research activity is mostly the aging of the population. Actually, as I always say to my students, Engineers, good engineers, are people that are able to transform weak points into opportunities. So when you do this watch analysis, it's always nice when you can transform a weak or a thread in an opportunity or a strong point. This really makes a difference, no? And actually, aging is a weak point for the society because at least in Europe, we have big issues with sustainability of the welfare. And with the current perspective, I think that the politicians will be crazy because they don't know how to solve the problem. And engineers can provide some, some tools to help in this. And of course, uh, why this is a problem? Because I mean, aging means uh, neurological diseases, means needs for rehabilitation tools. There are people that require chronic assistance because of, I don't know, post-stroke um, issues. Uh, and uh, there are other pathologies like uh, problems with uh, these vascular uh, diseases or vascular diseases, I mean, that can lead to amputation. And this is another big issue. Uh, if we look at the numbers in Europe and the US, we have about 60,000 new transfemoral amputees every year, which is a quite significant number. Uh, and these people usually have a lot of problems in activities of daily living because they cannot walk. Uh, actually, there's a, a famous study by Water and colleagues in 1970, uh, actually they measured the effort of working with a prosthesis and these people usually walk at 40% of the speed of a, a normal person and consume 2.5 times the energy on average. This is like very, very demanding for the, for, the, for the body. So the dream that we are pursuing here, I mean, it's not only my dream, it's somehow the dream of all the people working with, uh, with wearable robot is this idea of human exoskeleton symbiosis. Um, 50 years ago, more or less, um, a guy, Joseph Lick leader, that is quite famous guy, I mean, one of the founder of the artificial intelligence somehow, said that human computer symbiosis could be a doable thing. So what we would like to see, I mean, I'm not going to write a seminal paper on IEEE as he did, but I think that maybe in some decades we can really have a physical human exoskeleton or human robot symbiosis. Of course, which 
which one is the big challenge? I mean, AI is nice, it's cool, but in the end it's change of information. The big problem is when you start having also change, exchange of mechanical power, so Internet of Things, now it's called, but in the end is when AI comes into the world and somehow make actions on the real world. And this is, of course, not an easy job. If the world is the human body, in the case of the exoskeleton, this is crazy. I mean, there are many, many issues related to human exoskeleton symbiosis. Why is it complicated? I mean, if we look at the strong points of human and exoskeleton, you know that human are compliant system, they have brain plasticity. We are natural dampers. This means that we are prone to be stable. We are supposed to be intelligent, not all the guys, but most of them are intelligent and adaptable. Also in this case, this is not true for all people. Uh, and exoskeletons are robust, fast, are repeatable, precise, they have high power, and they are quite easy to set and control. Unfortunately, we have intra and inter user variability. We have somehow spastic reactions in the case of people with disabilities, and acceptability is an issue. Because, I mean, if you do an exoskeleton which works for China, it will not work for Japan, it will not work for Brazil, or the other way around. If you do something good for Europe, there are the so called ethnographic problems that somehow are very, very complicated to reach the market. On the other hand, exoskeletons are stupid. I mean, my respect for all the AI guys, but still I think that the robots are much stupid compared to what they should do, at least looking at science fiction. Uh, at least this is what people think about. I mean, people think that robots are incredibly intelligent, but still we lack in capability of generalization. They are not flexible and they are heavy. So this is the big issue. How to make a device that is comfortable, but still tightly fitting the human body as to be lightweight but structurally reliable and strong but still transparent. So this is the framework. So when I introduce to my students the wearable robotics field, I say, this is the story, okay? So, and of course, we need to make the robot being ergonomic. I mean, an exoskeleton must be ergonomic, but what it means, ergonomic is something very uh, somehow fuzzy, you know? I mean, it's not easy to have a, a definition of ergonomics. I can tell you what ergonomics means in our lab in the last I mean, 10 years working with exoskeletons. So first of all is kinematic design. We need to couple human and robot uh, kinematic chains. But this is not easy because human, um, human articulations are not rotational joints like the one of robots. So they are not ideal rotational joints or spherical joints. Um, of course, you need the modeling. Sometimes the modeling of this kinematic chain is very, very complicated. I don't want to go into details here. Uh, then you need to design an interface, a reliable interface, and then you make the validation afterwards, and then you, go, you can go back and do another loop of design. Then you have the output impedance. This is really one thing that, in many cases, students in particular don't get from the very beginning. A robot that has to interact with the human body cannot be like a traditional standard robot that you find in the FCA uh, plants, for instance. It has to be in able to at least be cooperative. So sometimes you also need that the output impedance has to be very low and you have to switch from one behavior in which the device is transparent to when the device has to be more stiff. And for instance, one interesting uh, solution here is to use compliant elements into the design of the robot. This is just a video that you see here um, that I'm not sure you can, maybe, yeah, you are, yeah, it's possible to see. So uh, maybe the audio is... Sorry? Ah, okay, so the robot is there. Yeah, sorry for the audio, but actually this is uh, what we consider a transparent exoskeleton for assisting the hip flexion extension. So it's a combination of the degrees of freedom, of the passive degrees of freedom at the mechanical level and the actuation that must be able of being extremely uh, transparent, so very low output impedance. Then we have intuitiveness, of course, I think that the, that video can be switched up. Yeah. 
So intuitiveness is how to make the robot understanding the human intention. So somehow how to embed some artificial intelligence into the robot. I like to say that my exoskeletons are quite stupid. I don't want machines that are too much complicated. We want to go on the market and still the main algorithms at the basis of the artificial intelligence for what's concerned pattern recognition, for instance, are not yet uh, reliable. So we are using much easy, I mean, you need 100% accuracy. This is not, not you, it's not allowed to have 99.999. You really need 100%. Yeah, I know I mean, but you are laughing, yeah, because, no. yeah. yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> so, and uh, how we are doing so, uh, actually we have, um, quite, um, I mean, uh, a quite know-how, a quite interesting know-how in uh, developing hierarchical control structure where we have state machine, for instance, to control um, the lower limb exoskeleton and provide assistance based on the different locomotion modes. And we usually combine um, adaptive oscillators with this kind of finite state machine. So the idea is that somehow you have simple algorithms that are able to catch the fundamental, the fundamental um, features of the rhythmicity of the gate in this case, and then based on that to provide assistance. But it's, in my view, it's not AI. This is more like observers, state estimators, which can be more easy to bring on the market than algorithms that can fit. For instance, this is something very interesting. You know, if you buy an electronic knee, an electronic knee prosthesis, People decide when they want to walk, they want to climb stairs or descend stairs by giving commands, moving the leg in a certain way because amputees want to be 100% sure that the prosthesis understood, let me say, what they want to do. So this is very critical. So this is one challenge for artificial intelligence community, going towards 100% accuracy in pattern recognition. This is not trivial in my view. Uh, then mass distribution, yeah, this is very, very, very critical. If you are going to design an exoskeleton by means of whatever you want as a method, we use trial and error design because this is really something that it's difficult to predict. You need to distribute the mass around the body in the proper way. So for instance, uh, you cannot have masses far away from, from, the, the, from the center of mass person, you need to use lightweight materials, electronics must be very compact and actuation units must be far from the moving parts and of course the distribution of mass around the natural central mass must be even because this otherwise can really lead to unpredictable behaviors. And then tailoring, of course, uh, a wearable robot is like a suit. Uh, all, the, all the people when they go to buy a suit, they, they want suit being tailored. I mean, the ideal scenario is that you go there and you buy a tailored suit, which is more expensive, of course. So also an exoskeleton must address the same idea and the same requirements. And this is, of course, an additional uh, payload for the engineers willing to, to face this field. I don't know how much time I have because I mean I, I like Fabio I try to talk too much so it's uh, uh, ten, minutes, ten, ten, minutes. ten minutes okay ten, fifteen yeah okay so I will go yeah mm, I'm not sure I, yeah okay no this is the, the proper way like it's, it's yeah. our school you know we, we take yeah more time, more time than necessary yeah <laughs> yeah but okay um, the first robot I want to um, quickly present is the elbow exoskeleton that we developed over the years. This is an example of how in 10 years you can reach a device that can be then experimented in the, in the clinics. So this device was actually invented for treatment of elbow spasticity. So we wanted a device able to manipulate the elbow and be able to switch from a stiff to transparent behavior as the physical therapist usually do. So at that time we started from um, a lab, I mean with a lab prototype and in particular, we invented a device with a, massive, a passive mechanism that, is, that allows the rotation axis of the exoskeleton to be aligned with the rotation axis of the elbow. So you see in this slide, actually, the, the axis of rotation can rotate on the frontal plane, on the horizontal plane, 
and then you can also have uh, the axis rotation sliding on the horizontal plane. These all together allow a comfortable interaction and a safe transmission of the torque onto the human joint. Um, at that time, actually, uh, there was also the need for this lab prototype of, a, as I said, a behavior which resembles the one of the physical therapist. So switching from a stiff to compliant behavior. And when I was a PhD student, I tried to make my life very complicated thinking about an antagonistic actuation like the one in the human, uh, in the human articulation. So we came with this variable impedance joint. Unfortunately, it worked well, but it was too much complicated. So when we had to move towards the clinical implementation, we decided to opt for a series elastic actuation where actually you have the real compliance, you can have torque control and position control. In case of spasticity, you can interact with a compliance system, and then via software, you can implement both, let me say, impedance control or transparent torque control. Um, the device actually, it's exactly like you see here. So you have the exoskeleton, the wearable part here, then you have bowden cable transmission, and then remotely you have the actuation unit, and then the the cable, the bowden cable bring the torque onto the, the, the driving pulley and in, inside the driving pulley there's a torsional element which is patented and which works as a, a torque sensor. So basically what we can do is that we can control the torque applied by controlling the deformation of the spring. This spring is not trivial to be developed because this is extremely compliant, the same compliance of the human articulation, 100 Newton meter per radiant, and can be able to apply huge torque, like 30 Newton meter of torque as a continuous torque. The device in this shape complies with the EU regulations for medical device, which was really mandatory to bring the device and try it into the clinics. This was really a two-year effort, let me say this, because this is something of a benchmark criteria if you want to do something similar. Uh, the carbon control system allows two things. One is the position control of the output shaft, and here you see the performance. So actually, this is more or less the, uh, let me say, the performance in, um, in terms of position control, and here you can see the performance in terms of torque control. So just to give you some numbers, we can reach um, a maximum, let me say, um, parasitic stiffness of 1 10 newton meter per radiant in the frequency range between 0 0.3 and 1.3. This means that if you move in this frequency range, you perceive an interaction under torque equal to zero control mode, which is similar to interacting with a spring of the maximum 10 newton meter per radiant. So you really feel like almost nothing in terms of parasitic interaction. And this is the video showing how the, um, actually the device works. So you see that in this case, this is a, a healthy subject and the device is displacing the articulation. And the interesting thing here is that you see while moving, there's really movement also of the rotation axis of the exoskeleton. This simple solution allows to fit the exoskeleton in less than one minute and you can safely apply huge torque without any risk of overloading the articulation of the, of the patient. So this is in interesting because, I mean, even in the simple case of the elbow articulation that everybody can see just as a flexion extension degree of freedom, if you want to make something which is consistent with the human body, your life will be still very complicated. And then this is just a video, another video showing what we did recently, and I mean, I, to make the story short, I didn't report the data, but actually we have experimented the device with 17 subacute patients in a, physical, in a phase two clinical study. And the result is that, I mean, this device can be useful to prevent spasticity from racing in this kind of patients. Of course, it's a phase two on a relatively small population, but you know, that in Italy, at least, if you want to go to a randomized control trial with large people, the ethical committee, first of all, asks for studies then where you can show that the device is safe 
and that the device can be effective in doing what has been designed to do. And in order to do so, actually a phase two clinical study is the best, the best approach. So of course, uh, since we are uh, engineers, we like to complexify our life more and more. Uh, yeah, this is uh, something that I must say I'm proud to complexify the life, in particular of the, my guys. I, mean, I try to, to keep it simple, but actually we said, why not trying to develop a, a shoulder elbow exoskeleton with the same principles? So serious elastic actuation, passive degrees of freedom, and possibility to switch from a transparent to a stiff behavior. Uh, a few words, a very few words um, about the Cyberlex project, which is the lower limb um, project that I coordinated until March this year. It's a new project. You can find really a lot of details on the website, but the goal of the project was to invent a new set of orthotic and prosthetic models for transfemoral amputees. As I said at the very beginning, amputees work with a lot of fatigue. We wanted to provide them with some tools to reduce the effort. And um, I mean, I will not go into all the devices. I just want to focus on the device that we developed as Squirrel Superior Santana, which is the active pelvis orthosis. So we started with a device helping working with less fatigue by providing assistance at the level of the hip flexion extension. So we wanted to develop a device that could be easily attached to the trunk in three points and to the tie in two points. Here you can see uh, the list of requirements for the alpha versions that we wanted to address in terms of maximum weight, maximum torque, and uh, anthropometry of the end users. And as we did for the NeuroExos, also in this case, we wanted to work with a series elastic actuator because actually we believe that this is really a clever way to provide a cooperative control mode. Uh, yeah, those are some constructive details. Uh, I mean, I'm more, I'm a guy that loves very much hardware rather than software engineering. So I like to show that we managed to get a, a joint of 1.2 kilo capable of around 43 newton meter of peak torque and a very little, a very small uh, output impedance. So it was the first attempt of designing the series elastic actuator of the active pelvis or Um uh, Let me skip the, the control modalities. I just want to show you two videos giving you an idea of what a wearable robot that wants to be comfortable should be able to, to do. So actually you see here a person that is able to do some football tricks. I don't know if you can see the video. Can you see the video? Okay. Um, and then, um, I mean, about the control strategies for providing gate assistance, there are really several possibilities. The one that we use more is based on this idea of adaptive oscillator. So you can imagine a pool of adaptive oscillator with nonlinear uh, filter. Uh, and basically, by combining together the, the, the nonlinear filter and the adaptive oscillator, you can get synchronized with a quasi periodic signal, like for instance the hip angle. And then, if you can synchronize, you can also predict the trajectory, and by predicting the trajectory, you can also implement a kind of impedance interaction, kind of virtual stiffness, attracting the person on the future trajectory. This is a, a nice way of providing a gentle and smooth assistance to the, to the gate. From the alpha prototype, we moved to the beta, which is the first attempt of having, as you see, is still not published. So um, it's, this is the first attempt of having a wearable device with autonomy, so battery operated. Unfortunately, in this first attempt, my engineers brought the weight to 8.5 kilo, so it was a little bit too heavy for, um, for the end users. But we still could make a lot of experiments outside the laboratory. So, what you see here in this slide is the third generation, which is actually the one that uh, is much lighter, still not that much as I would like to see, 
but we are at around four kilo of weight. And as you see here, you can even run while the system is able to deliver up to 10 newton meter of peak torque. This is uncomparable in the state of the art. There's no exoskeleton with similar performance in terms of uh, ergonomy and density of torque. Uh, yeah, it's so interesting for me that I usually go around uh, and give presentations with the, while wearing the exoskeleton. So it's the only way you have to show that the robot is really able to do what has been designed for. Um, and um, yeah, this is at the European Robotics Forum in 2015 in Wien, with yeah also some famous politicians that wanted to try the exoskeleton. So let me switch to the conclusion. As Fabio said in the very beginning, uh, on January this year, together with some colleagues, we raised a startup company, which is called Yuvo. Yuvo is a Latin word, means I assist. So the idea is that we want to bring on the market our wearable robots, starting from the gate assistant. And this is very important, we are targeting consumer robotics. So we don't want to just selling another medical device. Of course, medical devices are in our uh, portfolio of products, but we believe that the real market is in the consumer domain. So the big challenge is how to make a device like this costing a few kilo euro and really, I would say prêt à porter. I mean, in French, people would say. So really able to be used by all. And you should not imagine only elderly people, because this kind of technology can have applications. Believe me, I cannot tell you because it's part of our industrial plan. Believe me, there are several applications that are not into the medical sector that are much more interesting in terms of business opportunities. Uh, by the way, if you are interested in uh, this device, this device, because I mean, when you start a business, this is something that many people make in the wrong way. Many young guys start a business starting writing tons of industrial plans. When you want to start a business, you should start from a product. And actually, this device, as it is, is a product. It's a research prototype. So every university, every research center willing to do uh, experiments with our device, they can buy. They can get a copy. They can get open access to software. And for instance, so far, we have already secured so replicas have been already delivered, so they are working in labs, and two other replicas will be delivered soon, one by the end of the year, one the beginning of next year. So you can start your micro business and use the money of the micro business to attract other money and then create a value chain. So just let me conclude in saying that, okay, there are many projects that support our activity, because if you want to do research, you need money, a lot of money, and uh, yeah, this is the team of people that actually uh, work and worked and are working to these uh, activities. If you have questions, I'm very happy to reply. So you, I, I have a question. I was sure about <laughs> it. Um, so you quoted the, the limitations of pattern recognition yeah. for your purposes. May you elaborate a bit more? Yeah, actually, we have, of course, we have worked uh, with um, with algorithms like this. In particular, we pub we published last year a paper on robotics automation magazine uh, about the control of a prosthesis. So the purpose was, we want by means of a wearable sensor network done of IMUs and insults to understand when an amputee wants to start working, stop working, and when you want to, actually, you want to segment the gate phase and give command to the prosthesis based on the identified gate phase. Actually, uh, we achieved a very interesting performance between 95 and 99%. One, and but believe me, this is not sufficient. I mean, amputees want 100%. So we also have another bunch of data 
where we extended the approach also to ascending stairs, uh, um, descending stairs, sitting up, standing, uh, sorry, standing up, sitting down. So we have, I have a slide that I could show actually, uh, just uh, wait a sec on this, maybe. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, the time was very short, but actually, uh, where is it? Sorry. Yeah, actually, there's a, mm, there's a study where we could achieve very high uh, accuracy in understanding, yeah, this is the, the this is the slide. So you see here, basically, this is the summary of what we did in the experiments that we published on RAM last year. And here on the right, the unpublished data, where actually we can have, I mean, as you see, in some cases, if we are on the treadmill, we can have 100% of correct recognition of the different gate phases. If we go in the stair ascending, we can have 97% in some cases. Uh, so means that the different phases are recognized 97% correctly. The activity, so I want to start, start ascending the stair, is correctly recognized in 94%. And <clears throat> standing up and sitting down, the same, 98% and 96% for the different phases. And we used artificial intelligence. So we did different kind of algorithms. The one that we used is the one with the best performance. It's based on a decision tree. but this is not, it doesn't require any training. So it means that you do the, the, the identification for one subject and then you can generalize to five or six subjects without worsening the performance, okay? But still it's not sufficient. But uh, where you see the, the, do you think there is a, an inherent limitation or you think that you need some, <laughs> what you would need from? I think, that, I think that there are a combination of two things. The first is that that's the noise. I mean, all the sensors that you use are affected by noise. So you can have whatever you want in terms of extended Kalman filter or, um, I don't know, any denoising, uh, re re dimensionality reduction to extract really the relevant features, but still you have the noise. So because of the noise, you cannot get 100%. But in a sense, this is also something that happens in the human body because the way we solve this problem is by redundancy. So in the, in the real application, you should have too many ways to understand what the person really wants to do by observing the movement. You see what I mean? So if you don't have the reliability, the maximum reliability, since you are adding sensors, masses, wires, batteries, then it's much easier to have something like a button saying, okay, I want to go upstairs, I want to go downstairs, I want to stand up, I want to sit down. Because otherwise, after one day of testing, the de of using the device, the device will be left into the, into the room and nobody will use it. I mean, every, every time we do a focus group, every, do, every time we do a survey with the users, they want 100% and they want the device acknowledging that the the device understood what they want to do. So if you want to go upstairs, you say, I want to go upstairs. And the device has to vibrate or do something to say, okay, I understood you want to go upstairs. So because if you want this symbiosis, you need a reliable link. If your smartphone starts giving you, I mean, just to make an example, how many people use the gaze interface of the Samsung? I think 1% of people because it's not reliable. After a while, you start getting crazy and you want to throw out the device. I mean, this is what my feeling at least. So everybody wants to touch because the, the, the capacitive sensors are reliable. So a non-reliable interface is better not to take into account. That's my feeling. Okay, thank you. If are there other comments or questions? Okay, I have okay. one question from Plymouth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for a very, very nice talk. Um, I was just wondering, um, when you say 100% success rate, uh, for example, for a gate, what are you actually measuring? What is the, what is the metric you're using? What, what, what variables are you comparing? Yeah, yeah. This is, 
this is a very nice uh, this is a very nice point okay with respect to the prosthesis the success percentage were computed uh, with respect to the number of times uh, the prosthesis had to be able to recognize that change of the intention for instance we asked a certain number of times the person to start to initiate the gate and then we recorded how many times the algorithm failed in recognizing the, in the, I mean, the start of the gate in a certain number of milliseconds. Because, of course, as you can imagine, it's not just a matter of being able to recognize successfully, but also to make the recognition in a certain time. If I have to give a command to the prosthesis, I need to take into account the bandwidth of the device. So um, this means that actually offline we analyzed all the data in an expert way and decided when the algorithm had to be able to, rec to make the recognition. Of course, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, of course you can also have strategies when the recognition is not successful to uh, just uh, to recover. To recover yeah. Okay, so uh, this was a, a cool uh, talk also because uh, mm, uh, you may have noticed that some of the joints are passive, so uh, they are actually exploiting uh, some kind of, of uh, uh, maybe not morphological, compu of morphological computation. And uh, this is, I, I think, a typical second wave uh, robotics problem. So thank you for uh, staying with us uh, until now because uh, we are a, a little late, a little late. But um, and see you next week for the last lecture of this year. Thank you everybody for attending and thank, thanks to our speaker. Yes. Bye. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye.